everyone, welcome back to my channel and if you haven't been here before, my name is Ava and I'm a PhD student from UCL. So today I thought I'd talk about minor attractive persons or those with paedophilic disorder, specifically looking at treatment barriers, stigma that might relate to treatment seeking behaviour, as well as possible therapeutic goals and future implications on interventions. So first, a bit of an introduction. Firstly, it's important for counsellors and therapists to become more familiar with the treatment needs and services related to people with paedophilic interests. This could therefore enhance the competence to provide ethical, compassionate and effective counselling or therapy. This is especially important considering the stigmatised and how it's a hard to reach population. So what do we know about paedophilia and paedophilic disorder in relation to diagnostic criteria? So DSM-5 has categorised paraphilia and paedophilic disorders into two different subcategories. So paraphilia is related to intense and sexual interests. However, paraphilic disorders requires distress or impairment to the specific individual or harm or risk of harm to others. So therefore, individuals may have a sexual interest but may not feel distressed by this or there may not be a risk to harm and therefore this wouldn't be classified as a paraphilic disorder. Therefore, paedophilia would relate to attraction to prepubescent children, typically around 13, whereas paedophilic disorder requires a pattern of recurrent fantasies, urges or behaviours that persist at least over six months and this would cause distress or interpersonal difficulty. So now let's think of barriers to treatment, and from now on I'm going to refer to individuals as minority attracted persons, or MAPS for short. So researchers have found that stigma towards minor attraction can lead to avoidance of help seeking and therefore increase the risk of subsequent child abuse. While some MAPS report a willingness to seek therapy, less than half of these individuals actually found the experience helpful. Non-offending MAPS suggests that there are common themes such as self-loathing, cognitive dissonance, which is often contributed to enormous shame and despondence at the realisation that they are suffering from affliction that has no resolution. Therefore, suicidal thinking is extremely common and a suicide attempt has been reported to be seen in at least one-fourth to one-third of this specific population. Part of the stigma that is related to society is due to the scepticism that paedophilia is a mental illness and minor attraction is a specific choice. Therefore, negative societal narratives are internalised by these individuals, which infuses psychologically damaging beliefs, which then deters individuals from seeking help as well as influencing their self-identity negatively. Also, MAPS are reluctant to seek treatment due to expectations that they will be treated judgmentally and disrespectfully considering societal stigma, as well as fears of unethical breaches of confidentiality and apprehension that counsellors and therapists do not have enough knowledge about minor attraction. Therefore, most MAPS do not receive treatment until many years after they've considered it, and only a minority of these individuals are satisfied with the services that they receive. So now let's go into the therapeutic needs and goals which might increase the effectiveness of current interventions. So it's important to consider the difference between the specific individual goals of the individual compared to the goals that the clinician believes is important and how the discrepancy in that might affect the therapeutic alliance and relationship and therefore decrease the effectiveness of therapy. So MAPS report encountering that clinicians who assume that the dominant goal of therapy should be to control or change sexual feelings. However, MAPS themselves have identified a range of other psychological needs that they deemed as more important when seeking psychological counselling. These goals include a desire to increase self-esteem, decrease isolation, and deal with the social cultural stigma of minor attraction. This also includes understanding their sexuality and increasing the ability to create genuine and authentic relationships. This would therefore lead to reduced depression and increased contentment in their quality of life. Some clinicians also made assumptions that the client had already or would inevitably engage in victimization. Although some MAPS did identify sexual frustration as a goal of therapy, along with a desire to reduce child attraction and increase adult attraction. Therefore, this would lead to a dual focus on child sexual abuse prevention, as well as increasing client well-being. Preventing abusive behaviour is in the best interest of the MAPS clients since most wish to both avoid harming children as well as reduce suffering legal consequences. Therefore, some theoretical and clinical components from CBT could be applied. This would aim to avoid clinicians' judgment or invalidating responses to sexual orientation as well as gender identity. Affirmative CBT helps clients reframe one's view of themselves as disordered 
and pathological and goes towards a more accepting self-narrative to cope with the complex range of internal feelings and external messages that are both stigmatizing and demoralizing. Therefore, in working with MAPS, this clearly condemns abuse of children while also attempting to congruently realign thoughts and feelings of self-acceptance, while attempting to congruently realign thoughts and feelings towards self-acceptance. So now let's go on to specific examples of how these strategies might take place. Firstly, accepting and confirming the client's dignity and worth. The clinician's acceptance of the client does not imply endorsement of illegal or abusive contact. Secondly, using neutral language that reflects the client's preferred terminology. For example, referring to themselves as minor attracted or asking what term is more comfortable to be used. Also asking clients to share their view of themselves and how they recognize the evolution of their sexuality, helping make sense of their own self-narrative and identity. This involves remembering that sexuality is fluid, dynamic and uniquely experienced. Thirdly, clarifying the clinician's role and the primary purpose of the therapeutic relationship. For example, supporting the client's self-determination to improve their well-being. Because clients pursue mental health services for a variety of reasons, it is important for the therapist to seek the client's perspective. Fourthly, to be direct and not shy away from tough content. So this would include asking questions like asking how the minor attraction affects them on a daily basis, as well as what their biggest concern is regarding their sexual interests and without making assumptions. Fifthly, conveying an understanding of the client's experience as well as normalizing their feelings. For example, mentioning how isolating and lonely it must feel to have to keep this secret from society as well as close friends and loved ones, but also stating that they're not the only one who's had these feelings before. Sixthly, offering psychoeducation about paedophilia, minor attraction, and development of sexual attraction, which could then provide accurate information and disconfirm flaws that have been this would involve providing accurate information and therefore disconfirmation of flawed beliefs. For example, some maps believe from media that people with paedophilia are monsters who cannot be helped. Therefore, it's important to state that having these attractions does not make them a bad person and that you can see their desire to change and to confirm that they are not considering that they are there in therapy trying to reduce risk of harm to others as well as better themselves. Seventhly, to not assume that MAPS have an increased or more uncontrollable sexual urge than other people. However, it's also important to consider hypersexuality, impulsivity, emotional dysregulation or sexualized methods for coping with stress that could lead to increased risk of abusive behavior. These can be areas for assessment and attention if needed. However, if these are not seen, then it shouldn't be assumed that their sexual urge is stronger or more impulsive than other people's. It's important to also consider that some minor attracted individuals have history of childhood trauma or abusive trauma. Therefore, this can increase the risk of maladaptive thinking relational issues, self-regulation strategies, or ineffective coping. Therefore, a trauma-informed approach is required and would be useful in conceptualizing clients' problems, urges, and feelings. Number nine, acknowledging the pain associated with the loss of one's sexual self. Clients with exclusive minor attraction may find themselves in the inevitable position on having to give up the only potential source of sexual satisfaction. This may lead them to feel more destined to live a lonely life without intimate connection, marriage, or family. These individuals will then feel more lonely, sad or frustrated in the idea of giving up this part of themselves. And lastly, as stated earlier, it's important to offer hope that clients can have a normal life despite their minor attraction and they are also able to build meaningful, authentic relationships and pursue avenues of increased self-esteem. So just to summarize the potential goals, each individual will have unique needs and strategies. Some of the more common themes include self-acceptance, so dealing with stigma, shame and identity confusion, alleviation of related symptoms such as depression and anxiety, dealing with relationship and intimacy issues such as sexual and non-sexual intimacy, as well as secrecy being very isolating, thinking of future hopes, dreams and goals, having a sense of self-belonging, self-actualization and wanting the goals that other people have already achieved, as well as living an authentic life. So figuring out how to surround oneself with safe and supportive others in order to form genuine and close relationships. And now to talk about potential treatment implications, as well as why current interventions may not be effective. At the moment, there are schemes that have been designed to prevent or reduce the instance of child sexual abuse. These have been evaluated to risk relevant outcomes and have not shown particularly positive results. While the lack of treatment success may call into question the validity of such schemes, it may be that these schemes emerge as being more successful if broader psychological constructs would be considered as the outcome, for example, relating to well-being assessments. Furthermore, the risk-based framing of these schemes from offend 
assumes that maps need to be prevented from offending rather than supported through their psychosocial experience of attraction to minors. The very framing of prevention services, therefore, may play a pivotal role, not in making society safer, but rather in serving to potentially increase the risk of these behaviours by contributing to the worsening of mental health in those individuals, causing higher levels of guilt and shame and lower levels of self-esteem. Also considering that thought suppression has paradoxically been seen to increase rumination on thoughts and individuals who are going through societal stigmas are more likely wanting to suppress these thoughts due to their negative and low self-esteem which would therefore cause increased rumination of thoughts and decreased help-seeking behaviour. So in conclusion one potential therapeutic route may be to encourage acceptance of minor attracted individuals using a more identity positive approach. This would be emphasising treatment to be less related to risk reduction and more relating to promoting MAP's social and psychological well-being. This would mean that forensic risk reduction of child abuse would be a byproduct of this. Acceptance based Based approaches such as acceptance commitment therapy has been recognized as an alternative to cognitive behavior therapy. This works with the idea that people's difficulties occur when they attempt to avoid and suppress painful feelings or thoughts and presents more a positive psychological approach to dealing with this pain and distress. So the acceptance part of this therapy would be to accept that the sexual interest is a core part of the individual and the commitment part would be to promote the idea of living a crime-free life. Anyway, I hope this gave you a bit of an understanding into potential treatment goals as well as treatment barriers for individuals who are attracted to minors. If you have any questions about what I spoke about or any ideas of future videos then please comment below and if you like this video please like and subscribe. Have a good day!